we are now recording. Uh, so let's start talking about these notes. So uh, we're talking about Paul Graham's essay, uh, You Weren't Meant to Have a Boss. And uh, first notable point I put down here was uh, that societal progression, and he notes it as technology, but I think it's just society and civilization. The more civilized we get, it creates a growing disparity between what's normal and natural. And like, we see that every day, like when we're eating gross foods that aren't natural for our body, using tools that aren't natural for our bodies and staying in jobs that really aren't natural for our minds. And uh, I don't know, what do you guys think? Like, uh, do you guys think that like work as it is now is like too unnatural or is it something that humans can adapt to and like thrive in? I mean, I think different sectors and different areas will have, I mean, different problems. Like, uh, is it assumed that we're kind of talking about the office job in this? Yeah, discussion? office jobs. Okay, okay, okay. Because obviously, like, being like something like a plumber, I don't think that would have that same kind of idea. Yeah. But yeah, no, for sure, the typical office job. I mean, some people, some positions that people go for and apply for are legitimate data entry positions where, like, they require no thought at all to the point where people are listening to and consuming like other media through the whole day, like podcasts or music. So, yeah. and I feel like a huge reason why people do that is to stimulate their brain in the way that work isn't. So I definitely think like the, the modern office job, the vast majority of it is not stimulating the brain in the ways that you would hope. Yeah, I agree. Josh, do you have any points? No, I agree. I think humans are just extremely adaptable. Like our nature is, is essentially just like one of our greatest feats is the fact that we can adapt to the environment around us. And so regardless of how shitty your standard office job is, it's like we will ad adapt to do that. And I mean, the further adaption is that, you know, there's those menial tasks that aren't, you know, I mean, we're literally using no processing power to do. We're just doing them. But to replace that, the alternative to replace that is with AI. And then that person might not have a job anymore or, or whatever. So. I mean, we're going at pace with where we should be is kind of my thoughts on it. Yeah, I was thinking about this whole automation thing. And like, I think the big issue is, yeah, like a lot of these kind of low level entry jobs to a lot of uh, kind of menial work, they'll, they'll be gone. But it opens up like a lot more creative stuff because a lot of AI is building tool that helps us build tools that can help other people create without having much of a barrier to entry. Like for example, um, like the art that I do on my phone or my iPad, like without AI it wouldn't be possible. And I have like no formal artistic training and people were offering to pay from prints of art that I made with no kind of background and skill in it at all. So I think even people with zero skill in something, once AI gets good enough, they can start like creating content that they can start making money off of. I don't know like how much that will be, if it will be enough to like sustain like a living, but like there's definitely ways to make money from like using tools that allow you to be more creative more easily. And the other issue with that is theoretically, if more and more people were going to those pursuits, it would also dilute those pursuits and only the best of the best, I guess, would still survive, right? Yep. Like, I don't know about that because like, sorry, um, I was thinking about like, YouTube, for example, like mm -hmm. think about like all the creators on YouTube, like it's not like YouTube's getting diluted. It's just like, there's just way more channels with millions of views, like, and they're still making good money. Like, yeah, it's true. I think, yeah. Cause I think the thing is that it, it spreads out with like different niches within YouTube, but each niche kind of has like a few big players, I guess. I just don't know if there's a bunch of like smaller ones in that space that like no one knows about because like yeah. only a couple can make it per like Th that's what happens the lower the barrier entries there are there's going to be more competition it's simple as that yeah fair. I mean, you take cbd as an industry in a whole where there's literally all you need is uh you know to do it in the states you need to be american and you need to file a couple pieces of paperwork and pretty much not have been arrested before you can start a business that's why there's right now about six thousand different cbd brands running in america how many of those are successful less than 0.1%, but it seems like there are a ton of really successful CBD companies. That's not true. 99% of them are dog shit, 
similar to myself. We're just trying to scrape to get in that top 1%. Uh, that's just how it is because there are so few barriers to entry. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah, it, like what's happening, what I think it's doing is since it's making everything a creative pursuit, it's making everything more like subject to like power laws. So you're going to get more kind of disparity and like, it's going to become more unequal. Uh, the more, uh, we go towards creative pursuits, I think. Like, there won't be any value in doing anything repetitive because the computers can do things repetitively way faster and cheaper than us. All right. Um, so, Paul Graham comes from like a startup background, um, and he actually he created basically what was like the original Shopify, like the first uh, first kind of web builder, web store builder, and Yahoo bought it. And so he has like a lot of experience with his own startup, but also um, he has Y Combinator, which is the most prestigious and most successful startup accelerator in the world. And so basically the point of view he's coming out this with is that startups are kind of the way that people are meant to work. And I kind of agree with him here and you guys might disagree, but um, basically the whole crux of his argument is that humans are meant to be kind of like working in small groups uh, with a lot of creative freedom and little uh, bureaucratic overhead and working as a team um, and working towards something like survival. And uh, that's what they do in startups because if the startup doesn't succeed, they, they die. Like the startup dies and all their dreams and hopes and everything they had die with it. So it puts us in, I think like the thing that speaks to me the most about it is that it puts us in that kind of mindset of like, like fight or flight, like kind of live or die. And like, that's kind of like what humans, like that's how we evolved was like, we were able to, to hunt down and, and survive uh, through the grassland, like the harsh grasslands in, in Africa. And yeah, I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? Can I, I just think it's an impossible reality to think that like the whole world should be made up of a bunch of small businesses where everyone is equally passionate and willing to work equal, put as much effort as they're supposed to put in. I just think that that's just not how the world works. Too many bad eggs, too many people who just don't care enough, too many people that just want to go by invisible and they're super happy to come home to just whatever home is to them. Right. Or I, I think we're all coming at this from the, the standpoint of being somewhat ambitious young individuals. Life hasn't beaten us up. They haven't taken the piss out of us. We've been told no a thousand times for anything. So we still have the energy to want that as a future. But a lot of people just rather just blend into the crowd. And I, I don't think that would be something that's like, like from my experience, I have a very close friend who like the best, the happiest thing for him is not just working a physical labor construction job, but doing a physical construction labor job where it's a repetitive, the same task every day. That's what makes him happiest. For me, that sounds like a nightmare. So I, I think our, our, even our current world is kind of suited to how it's almost supposed to be in some sense, kind of like the ant colony idea. Like people are in positions where we're as best as we can. Anything more than what we have now it's just like, I mean, unless we went to like a way more social state, kind of like, you know, Finland or Sweden, where, you know, education is completely free and there's no barriers to any, to, to, to way less things, then I just don't think it's even a, pos a possibility to consider as a future. But would it work well? M maybe. <laughs> I feel like I'm somewhere like in the middle of those two things, because on one hand, I definitely think that the whole, um, like that it's more natural for companies or just groups to be in smaller sizes. Like I think for sure it's more natural. And I think that the larger groups, like once starts, when you, once you start getting to even higher numbers, you're going to cause inefficiencies through that because not everyone will be interacting with each other. You, like, you'll have more people with different goals and motives, maybe not driving towards the same purpose. And like when you try and pick out 20 people to a company, I feel most of those people are going to be more dedicated, more dedicated to the company because they can more likely see how their work is impacting the company's success. Whereas in a big company, 
Some people are just there to like collect their paycheck and don't give a shit about the company. And that's going to cause problems. I mean, but that, sorry to interrupt, oh, but ahead. that's also like, that's such a nice way of thinking about the world that to, to think that, okay, if we put everyone in smaller groups and they're actually contributing something, they'll be happier. Some people just want to see the world fucking burn. It's true. Like, and so many people want to see the world burn. It's, it's a really crazy thing. Like, even you look at the looting happening, for example, currently, you know, with, with everything happening in the States, it's just like, you can't, you don't know anybody who would do that, really. You can't think of anybody. But that's because we are in such a small bubble, perhaps, mm-hmm. right? And, when, and that's the same with our, our work ethic and our drivers and goals in life. I think we just look at it from such a privileged perspective and I'm For not sure. trying to make this any type of PC argument. It's just like, no, most people are fucking lazy. But that's where I agree with you that I don't think it's a realistic thing. I just think that it's probably the most efficient way to go about it. Sure. That's true. I, I mean, it's fine. It's easy to find the bad egg when you're only looking at a dozen rather than when you're looking at, yeah, you know, a dozen. exactly. The thing is, the thing is, yeah, like, Let's, I think the way that like, com- the way that, first of all, when we're educated now, we're kind of like the way they educate us is conditioning us to be like submissive and to work for someone else and be given assignments and finish things by deadlines and not create our own work for ourselves. So like our entire lives, we've been conditioned in one way. So it's no surprise to me that most people kind of have this lazy kind of thought that like, I just need to get this done and then I can just chill and do nothing else. But then like, the people who kind of like think past that which are us and then like the people who kind of like want to like the people who didn't fit into the regular system they're just like this is system isn't for me because like it's clearly we're not meant for this it's just that some people i guess are more adaptable and they're able to like withstand like more I, well, those, I are, those are the leaders and the bosses that's almost like the world's natural way of like segmenting it right but but the thing is is like for example if you were if we were like in a smaller community um, people who are like less, uh, like, let's just say less able, they, they take up tasks that are like specific to them and there's no economy. So, so like, they don't really like, they don't get left behind. So that's like one, mm-hmm. one thing that like we need to think about is like, there will be people who are just less able and like, they won't be able to like contribute in some ways that other people can. And that's just obvious by the way, like gen- genetics works. And even if we like fix all the nurture stuff. Like there's always going to be nature. And I, I still think that like, even if we consider all those people who can't do it, I think there's still a lot of people who would be much happier working in a smaller team or smaller company than there are currently. Like there's way too many big companies that like are kind of like sapping like industries. And this is like kind of like a morals perspective that they're sapping industries of innovation, which would help people like in general, like technological innovation because the slower that like the bigger the company is the slower they are is like Graham argues in this essay and the slower you are the more likely you are to like not adopt like new practices and adapt to like new techno- technologies and it just puts everyone in a worse position when we rely so heavily on like a few central institutions few central companies that don't end up changing over time so like there's many, it's like the problem is multifold it's not just like the issue of like the people who are in the company are unhappy working there it's like what are the consequences of like when you're unhappy working at a company, you don't do good work, then the company who's providing it, for example, like if you work for a bank, like banks provide bad service because most of the people working there, they don't really care. They don't have skin in the game. They just work there because like they get a paycheck and it's a good paycheck and have great benefits. And like some people have to work pretty hard. Others don't have to work as hard, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I think it's definitely very unnatural in general, just sitting at a desk all day, even for programmers. I think it, by nature, their job is inherently not natural. And one second. I mean, I think we all come at this from a really interesting perspective from like different stages in life. And that de- definitely just like all of us coming from different edge to some extent, education background. Yeah, like we were all educated, like pretty, like, like we went to private schools, but at the same time, like, I don't know, like we, we, like 
I think even people who are like from lower back, like lower socioeconomic status, like they can, like with a different system with like when they're, if they're not being conditioned to be employees, I think then like they would be happier. Like maybe people are happy because, or like they have this vague sense of happiness because what Paul Graham talks about here is like most people, like they're kind of like somewhat satisfied, but at the same time, they're also somewhat dissatisfied. So like he talks about it here a group of 10 people in a big company is an artificial tribe. So like you have like the right amount of people, but the key ingredient missing is like that individual initiative because anything you try to do in a big company, like it's going to be met with resistance at every level. So it stops people from, yeah, what Holden was saying, like you can't really see the impact you have because you don't really even have a say over your impact. And I mean, it's an interesting feedback loop that you just kind of inadvertently pointed out also. It makes it really, for the innovators, it makes it very unattractive for them to go to those corporations in the big place. So it might not even be, I mean, it's twofold, right? The corporations are slow to adopt new technologies or um, efficiencies per se. And the people who want to bring those efficiencies aren't going to go there because they like things to be efficiently done and it's inefficient in the first place. So there's nothing that would attract them to go to like a big company unless, you know, they have a really attractive officer in office or offer and they are doing you know that innovation so like google for example even though it's a big company they've been able to get over that problem because they are the forefront well actually they haven't so this are uh, this this essay argues that working in a big company even like facebook is not good because um he actually cites like direct like anecdotes from like one of the founders that went through the y y combinator startup accelerator and this founder said that they had originally thought of starting a, starting their company right out of school, but they thought they'd learn more at Google because they have all these like processes set up, like best practices. You've learned like industry stuff, but he, but the thing is, is that programmers specifically, and the same thing with like, like more creative oriented jobs is that you can only learn by doing. And if you can't do things because you're limited either by like hierarchies and bureaucracies or limited by the code, you can't really actually like learn much. So after he went through a couple years uh, as a, hey, hey Dylan, Daniel just joined as well. Yeah, so uh, just to catch you guys up, hey Daniel, just to catch you guys up, I was just saying that like even Google, like even at the forefront of um, innovation has really fallen behind because of the size they've grown to because um, they aren't people who work there aren't able to do things because they're stuck uh, dealing with code that doesn't let them innovate, and also people in the company that uh, inevitably don't let them innovate. Uh, and this is tying back to this original argument that um, you can't really have a, a innovative company, and people aren't really happy working in big companies because uh, they don't have any kind of individual autonomy, and they kind of are kind of cogs in the system. Um, and Graham specifically is using like a food metaphor and he's saying that like, what's like normal food? Like normal food is like high fructose, like corn syrup, like hydrogenated vegetable oil, white sugar, white flour. And that stuff's really bad for you. And the same thing, like if you choose any random company, like what are like the normal standard companies you think that are good to work for? Like Bell, Thomson Reuters, Rogers. <laughs> I mean, but like those are like the standard like in google apple like those aren't good places to work those are pretty things. bad places to work but yes and no you have to think that at, at least in those scenarios you will have perhaps good mentors and even though there are rules yeah. or things that really prohibit your own learning and your self-development at the same time you learn so much by by even by by that in itself happening when you are limited to what you can do or what you can choose to do, that in itself is, is, is a really valuable learning experience. So to say that, oh, that guy shouldn't have gone and worked at Facebook for two years, I think it's like, uh, maybe he wouldn't be where he is if he didn't learn how bullshit it was to work there first. Yeah, the issue is, is that most people get stuck in this kind of like, like there's tons of people, like I'm part of like some Discord chat where there's a bunch of people who know ex-Googlers or people who currently work at Google and you can go years at Google without really working on anything that ever gets seen by anyone. And like 
some people like they're fine with that. They're fine with going years of like just getting paid and like not doing anything, but like you don't get fulfilled by that. You just get like your wallet like gets bigger, but like you're not really fulfilled because you're not really doing anything. Like, like okay, so I guess, point, I guess his argument comes down to people can't be happy unless they feel fulfilled, right? Exactly. And, and how do people feel fulfilled? They get rewarded to some extent, rewarded they, with something. No, so Shopify, like, Shopify, would you say most of the workers at Shopify are happy because they are rewarded with enough extras? I'd say well, so. I don't know if it's about the extras. It's about like having, like seeing how your work like contributes to like something meaningful. For example, like when I was teaching people in person, I felt a lot more fulfilled than creating courses that I knew that hundreds of people were like doing but it felt way more fulfilling when I got that immediate feedback that I knew like what's being like, what's being taught is being absorbed and people are getting it. And like that gave me fulfillment. And it's the same way. Like, for example, like when you were making like a sale at like uh, your last at sales talent agency, like when you made a sale, doesn't it feel great when you get the sale? Like it's a reward in itself, regardless of how much money or bonus you get. Yeah. Like, but my mar great. marginal utility just kept going down and down. Eventually you need, other forms of motivation like money is just not enough regardless of what you're doing well, exactly you like that's why like like people can kind of, kind of can get bored of sales and they move to different sales selling different things or doing different things because like sales is a repetitive task it's doing the same thing kind of over and over like it's the same funnel right you can like once you rate like you can keep iterating your process until you reach that like ideal state but like once you reach that ideal state like it, it can it can get boring and the same thing with like a lot of jobs, like same with my writing job, like in, that you can get like become like repetitive and automated. And that's when like you start feeling like this malaise. And like, I feel it all the time. Anytime I'm doing something where I'm like, I know how to do everything. There's like, it's just complete order. There's no chaos. Like you just feel kind of like, like malaise Like it's just lazy feeling. You don't feel like doing it because it's just so easy. It's mm -hmm. just like pointless. Like I don't feel fulfilled when I'm writing an essay on something that like, It'll take me two hours to do and like I'll learn like a couple things, but like it's just not it's just the same process. All right. Um what else? Yeah, so he, he likens having like going to Google after like being an MIT graduate to having like a pizza for lunch. It's like the thing that's like like it seems good, like taste has like that immediately gratifying uh, effect, but then like you don't see like the negative detail the deleterious effects until much later. And uh, I really like this quote he puts here, uh, in an artificial world, only extremists live naturally. And I really, mm -hmm. uh, it brought, brought up this point. It's not mentioned there, but I just thought of uh, this quote from Jiddu Krishnamurti. It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. I love Krishnamurti. That guy is a G, was a G. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I feel like doing things like, like, that's why, like, it's become almost like, it's funny because become like basic has become kind of like a slang, like, like, like a bad word. Like it's like, you're mocking someone when you're calling them basic. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, dude, like they're so normie, like normies. That's like a full on, like, um, like we can even see it in the way that we speak. Like we make fun of people who act normal because being normal, like in society now means you're sick. <laughs> I don't know if you guys all agree with that, but I'm just assuming you do. I mean, it's funny because it's changed. Because back in the day, like being a nerd or different or not, like if you didn't fit in, if like into like that, then that was bad. So it's funny just how now so much we're praising the individual. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's, there's two schools of thought. Like I feel like for the average individual, um, it's it's like a huge risk to like step out of the the comfort of society and like say like yeah, like, I'm not going to take the job at Google, like, I'm going to go, like, try something weird that, like, you know, it's going to look weird on my resume, or, like, you know, like, oh, I'm going to try to start a business, like, I think for the majority of people, like, we're talking about law of averages, like, they're almost comfortable, like, even dealing with, like, the sick society, so to speak, um, but, yeah, like, Bardia, like, I definitely fit in the camp of, like, thinking, like, yeah, like, traditional thinking is, is pretty shit, like, there's definitely more drawbacks to the way, um, we structure society now in terms of fulfillment but like i said like i think the that's the difference with like all these conversations we have like every sunday it's like we're not we're not having these conversations for like the average joe walking down the street who's like just happy to be like 
collecting his check every week and like has a house you know wherever it is and like some kids like i think there's deeper levels of meaning and like it really depends on like where you want to uh really where you want to like draw your effort like some people are just incapable of getting to certain levels of meaning you know? yeah I, I think that's like a failure of our education system that we aren't able to bring people into society with like the right people kind of want, mindset. I think people like want, people want different things. I know. Oh, yeah. like, I think, but I think like, no, actually I think we all want the same things. Like, like we well, were talking about this at the, the multidisciplinary approach to thinking by Peter Coppin. Like we all want like to be respected. We want all of these things. We want to be fulfilled. We want to have meaningful relationships. Like we want to have meaningful work. Like everyone wants that. Like, no, like, I understand someone who has, finds meaningful work in even repetitive labor because you can see the fruits of your labor. You're doing construction, you're doing plumbing. You're seeing like, oh, this thing wasn't working before, now it's working. Like, yeah. that's the same thing with like progr programming. Like, you created something out of nothing, and it's like there's like this magic magical wizardry you like orchestrated in the background. Like, it gives you like yeah. this kind of like yeah. fulfillment. I think I'm this is why. To... I, sorry, I think it's ahead. sorry, sorry. I think this is yeah, why. Um, this is why establishing reason for writing for yourself is so important because uh, you're really challenging yourself and your mind to expand, not because of someone else's motives or someone else's uh, incentives. I think you learn to do it for yourself so that you can, um, you're, you're, you're equipping yourself with the right tools to go out and try, try your hand at challenging the mainstream ideas and norms because Change is very difficult for a lot of people. I think that's kind of like, it's a bit of a, uh, you can think of it metaphysically as well, but like staying stationary uh, is often easier. So staying in the same position for the duration yeah. of your career or taking a job that might have a good safety cushion might seem like the right thing to do. But like, like Barty was saying, ultimately you end up feeling not fulfilled, not satisfied because you feel as though you're doing it for for comfort and comfort isn't the entire story you can you can kind of point to maslow's hierarchy of needs right like if ideally we want to achieve that final pyramid which is self-actualization you know like josh doesn't want to be known as the guy who worked at google josh wants to be known as a guy who worked on a project that was was a passion of his and that he had been thinking about since a yep since a young age <clears throat> and um that gives you a much deeper sense of fulfillment because you feel like you've taken your own path to get there. Um, now, obviously doing that requires a lot of intersection with the mainstream society. You kind of need to understand, you need to be, uh, I feel like it's important to work at something somewhere like Google because then you can, like Josh was saying, you can identify what's wrong and, and all the shitty things about it. And, that has to be, you have to kind of look at it as a stepping stone as opposed to, you know, a resting zone, right? It's not something where you should just say to yourself, okay, well, I'm satisfied. I'm working this job. Um, uh, I have a, you know, I have, and this is, this is all that there is for me. Um, you should really be, you should really be expanding your horizons as much as you can. And th there's something to be said for technological investment because, it's, it's one of the most hotly debated, one of the most difficult spaces. And really it's, it's the frontier of, of humanity. And I think that's what we need to push ourselves towards. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I question there is like, um, you know, sort of what I was mentioning before, like who are we to say someone doesn't find self-actualization by, you know, working at Google for 20 years? Like, I think, you know, I find this with a lot of people, like there's almost like a, a self-awareness that Certain people, like, you know, A, aren't even capable of getting to, but B, sometimes they don't even want to get to that point. I don't know if you've ever met anyone like this. Um, a, yeah. A ton. Traveling, yeah. A traveling, travel America. Just go yeah. through the smaller towns and you'll be yeah. like, they're happy. Yeah, people are so satisfied yeah. with living that kind of life. And you're right. Like, I'm not saying that working at Google doesn't give you self-actualization. Yeah. I'm saying yeah, that yeah. You, you just have to, you have to determine what it is that gives you self-actualization go after it. It's, it's not even, it's about having a path to self-actualization without even giving someone the option for it, for, for a better future, mm -hmm. then they'll already almost be happy. Like I lived in a small town in Mexico and the happiest people I've seen yeah. are people, you know, on the side of the street selling fried plantains or at yeah. their taco stand. Yeah. 
they aren't trying to expand. They don't want two plantain stands. So, they don't want a taco restaurant. They to, are to bring very us back. happy doing what, doing what they're doing. I, it just comes down to the fact that because they aren't always – they aren't shown, like, a treat that they can't have in front of them. Right. That they're happy. They can accept what they're currently doing versus now with social media and everything. We're, like, shown, oh, here's a millionaire. Here's a billionaire. Here's – pay $5,000 to get into this course to learn how to be rich overnight. I'm teaching how to yeah. invest in houses. Like, no, there's no pain to get rich like that quickly. Yeah. You still, I don't know. No, yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Urbanized in the world have some of the lowest rates of happiness uh, because, of, because of that very reason that it feels like a rat race. And even if you're, you know, even if you win, you're still a rat. That's a, that's yeah. a famous quote. Yeah. Um, but the, the, this is why I never rely on happiness. I think it's a very flawed heuristic. Like happiness mm. is it, it only lasts in the moments. Um, and, and really like if you're basing your life on happiness, it's very much approaching or approximating hedonism, right? Yeah. Where you're trying to work on, okay, the next, the next emotional fix that will, that will make me feel happy. That's why like, I think meaning is a lot more of an important heuristic. You know, what you're doing right now, you, it might not make you happy. Like working at Microsoft might not give you self-actualization. So let's... It, give, it might give you the right tools and the right mindset to say to yourself, hey, my future job, I don't want it to be like this. I don't want to be stuck in this nine to five. I want to expand my horizons. There are people who become lawyers and doctors and they reach some of the most conventional um, mountains of... Of accomplishment and realize that that's not for them and that there has to be more to life than just going to the courthouse every week or uh, seeing thousands of sick patients and then there are other people who find meaning through those things they say like I want to be able to uh, help people through legal means people who are uh, uh, impoverished or people who don't have the right resources or I want to help the sick I, I want to be able to give lend myself to you know, um, to, to make, mm -hmm. to make my environment a little bit better. Yeah. I think meaning sustains far better than happiness because meaning allows you to go through the tough times that make you unhappy to yeah. get to what then brings happiness to you. But what are we like, what is, what, what is meaning? Cause like the thing is like, for example, like we have those like direct ways of getting meaning, like, like teaching is one way of getting meaning, like helping people who are like in need directly, like volunteer work or like charities, like, well, not charities, like actual volunteer work or like being a hot, like a doctor or a nurse or like a care specialist or like, like a, Do you want someone who works with people. Like we're like all that? like, we're all like knowledge workers. So like what we do is more in terms of like thinking with our heads and not really about um, like helping people directly, like face to face, like in person. So like, how do we find meaning in our jobs? Like, for example, like there's like the industry specific approach where you go into an industry where like the tangential business goal is that. So like, even if you're working in like the finance department, but you're working for like a hospital, like you're still helping out people get like, but like, do you really find meaning in that? Like, can you find meaning in something I, that's so like removed from like the final people getting helped? Well, again, again, it's what you, it's, it's how you weigh meaning, right? Like for me, this is my personal opinion on it is, I think that which provides value for you in the long term and also provides value mm -hmm. back to the society, yeah. I think that has a certain level of meaning, right? And value, you know, we, we, all, we all define value differently. And, and that, that, yeah, so it's about values. Yeah. I'm, so I'm going to say something out of left field here as a hedonist okay. myself. Okay. Um, happiness is fucking paramount. Happiness is why we do everything. Unfortunately, we've gotten to a point in society where happiness is too far gone. And now it's just about feeling yourself and feeling normal. Like people are past the point of just wanting to be happy. They just don't want to be depressed or anxious. They're fine with being sad. They just want to be normal. But at the end of the day, like what we do should, should be happy. It's not necessarily meeting. Like the reason we have endorphins, the reason we have these chemicals in our body is it, it's for happiness. It's for pleasure. It's for joy. But what if, but what if, what if, change the meaning like what if what if you as a person find happiness in making other people suffer then what this is the problem is like but if i say the same I'm, thing sorry go ahead 
um, I'm just saying like, ha like if, if your happiness is infringing on someone else's happiness, right? At what point do we draw the line? Do we say like, you shouldn't sure. be happy. And, and this that's an be? entirely different moral debate. And the reason yeah. that we have laws and a society that confines us to try and enjoy life to the best of our abilities without impeding on other people's ability to even experience joy. But then you get into this whole world of our current state of social justice worries where one person's happiness now is, you know, just cutting someone else's legs off. Not, so, not literally, but like just making fun of people like that. was. Okay. So, so here's, okay. So I can, uh, I'm going to counter that with, you've heard of Nozix thought uh, experience machine, right? Have you, yeah. have you guys ever heard of Nozix yeah. experience? Yeah. So it's this, it's this, it's this, um, basically it's this idea. If you suppose that you're in this perfect machine that will, that will replicate the world the way you want it so that you're living the happiest life. You're living the ultimate life. Is that enough to satisfy? If so, maybe happiness is the right heuristic to yeah, go by. Yeah. But, but a lot of people wouldn't live in that kind of world because none of their actions are really consequential to the real world, right? And if I change a few of your, and this is stepping away from nausea things, but if, if I change a few of the neurotransmitters in your brain, your definition of happiness will change with it. And I just feel like as we get older, our definitions of our, our, uh, our, our priorities and our factors for what make us happy can change, right? If I'm marrying a woman now who makes me happy, am I going to stay with her for the rest of my life? If it's based on happiness, maybe not, because at some point down the line, I'm not going to be happy with her anymore. But if I'm marrying a woman who shares the same values as me, who is doing something meaningful with her life, who I know I'm going to be able to survive with, even outside of love, right? Because love is... is, is that, but that's that's where like disparity and, and, and wealth and all these other things come in. If you took, if you took everything aside, if you, there was no moral societal judgment for you just leaving your wife. Like if you're not happy anymore, leave. What's stopping you? Society, maybe kids, maybe a job, maybe a house together. But at the end of the day, if you just kept doing what made you happy, I, I mean, that, I, that's why we're here. That like, fuck, without things, without... Yeah, well, the I thing mean, is, we experience is like, things. You're right. There, there's there's a massive importance at doing things that aren't meant to make us happy because get it, if happy was too easy, it wouldn't be happy anymore. Well, I that's believe. the problem. It has but, evolutionary. It has an evolutionary purpose. Like when you put someone in a difficult environment, you know, like you could look at something like studies of rats when they're put in a neurally stimulating environment, the dendritic branches off their neurons are far more nuanced. And there's a lot, there's a lot more happening there as opposed to leaving someone in an environment where they don't feel challenged, where they don't feel like they're pushing their boundaries. So it's something, it's a balancing act, right? Like you have to be able to kind of realize there's a short term and a long term to everything. And what might not make you necessarily happy now might make you happy later and vice versa. What might not be, what might be making you happy now, you know, so. But I, but that's talking about the, the current state of happiness. I'm just talking about we're always should be striving for happiness. Well, it's like, it's like, what is happiness? Like, what does it really mean? Like there's different types of happiness. There's like the joy I get from like, like when something like you get that it's aha like, moment, there's like that joy from an aha moment, but then there's the joy from like, like if you're on psychedelics, there's like, there's, there's that joy. Then yeah. there's like, there's a different, no, no, but then there's different types of joy. There's like the fulfillment you get. It's like, Oh, I did a good job today. Like I feel happy at the end of the day. But it feels completely yeah. different than the joy I get from like laughing with my friends about a stupid joke or like thinking back yeah. to like a fun time in my life. Right. They're different types. Yeah. They're not like, like people just like say like, Oh, happiness, but it's just like, Agreed. it's like, there's just different emotions associated with different things. And I think the problem is, is that when you look, when you try to like look for short term happiness, like things that give you short term happiness, like, like really good tasting. It becomes food, like a drug. Like, yeah. It's, it's addicting. Like, like Naval yeah. tweeted today or it's, yesterday. It's Okay. Yeah, about like There's you can replace like all the meaningful stuff in your life with like meaningless things like completely because like you can just replace it without and your body doesn't realize it's being replaced so like you can replace sex with porn and that's what tons of people have done they've replaced work with games because they get the same reward same dopaminergic dopaminergic reward they replaced um they replaced uh now i can't remember that's a fallacy 
that like to think that porn and sex are equal is well, a no, lie made up. People, to- people have replaced it the same way people replace water with Coke. It's like Coke but, tastes better and it can replace it's water true. as your water, but like you'll die. <laughs> Like it's also like porn. It's, it's like you can you can do that all day. You can jerk off to porn as much as you want. But then one day, like when you can't get hard, when you actually need to have a child, then you're fucked. So that like, your child could jerk you off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, I just think like I think I, I agree with that point, and I think there's a lot to be said for how you define happiness. And the fact that happiness, like when you're talking about dopamine, dopamine has been single-handedly one of the largest indicators of evolution, like what, we, what humanity has moved towards. Because we're always, we always have this risk-reward system, and it's, it's just like a balancing act of trying to figure out how, how you can get what you want while also providing meaning, while also making you like happy in the moment and being present, and then planning for your future and learning from your past – it's difficult. It has to be. Well, I think, I think a big problem is like people just look for like, yeah, like we were saying, like everyone looks for like easier solutions. Like they don't realize like the, like the stuff that makes you feel fulfilled, like the stuff, like when the you're cop- like 80, when you're, eight, when you're 80 years old, for example, like you want to like, you want to, you want to think back to your life and say, Oh, like I did something. Not but- like, Oh, I didn't really do anything with my life. I have all these regrets. <laughs> it really depends on your starting point, though, hey? Okay? What like, do you mean? Like, I feel like meaning is, is like I said before, like, it's for people who've, like, got, got to a certain point of awareness. You know, maybe they've had that first job and, like, you know, maybe they have enough uh, flexibility in their lives where they can actually, like, derive meaning. Like, there's something to be said about, like, someone who, like, comes from, like, poverty, like, you know, like Josh said, like, the guy selling oranges on the road, like, I'm not saying his life isn't meaningful. I'm just saying, like, I don't think he'll ever get to that point in his life, like, where he's thinking, like, oh, I could have done something else. Like, there is, like, an analysis paralysis for people who have the, the flexibility to really contemplate meaning that certain yeah. people who are just surviving don't, don't even have that luxury of. And the question is, maybe is that better? You know, so, maybe that, well, that's how you get meaning. I, I personally agree with Bardia because, uh, and I can put that to word, for me, meaning is legacy. I want to know that at the end of my life, I've left something here. And you know what? That guy selling oranges on the street, he's leaving behind a legacy. People, sure. if, who knows? If he's, if, he's, if he's living his life to the best of his ability, there are people after he passes who are going to say, there was a guy here who used to sell oranges and he used to cheer up people as they walk by. Um, he used to have a lot of value to the community. He used yeah. to be a good man. Those are things that, Really, life can boil down to simple things like that. And that in itself yeah. can give you happiness well, on your death. So you're, you're laying there and you're thinking to yourself, you know what? I was good to my peers. I was good to my friends. I, had a, yeah. I, I was good to my family. I've raised good kids. Those, that, that is like one of the most fundamental things that can make you happy. And then from there, you, have, you, you can elevate yourself to say like, I, I published a paper that um, had some lasting change, you know, even someone who might come out and say something really wrong, you know, you're inspiring people to come out and debate and you're pushing the narrative further for all of us, right? Like someone like, this is kind of off the cuff random, but Sigmund Freud, right? There's a lot of controversy and, and there's a lot of nonsense that this guy has said that we now know to be nonsense, but he opened the floodgates, right? Like he, he, he allowed people to come yeah, in yeah. and look at his studies and say like, okay, this is wrong. This is right. This is, you can add an asterisk here and so on. So forth. I, I don't so, disagree with you. I, I was just saying it like, like my question was maybe, you know, the hunt for meaning is perhaps easier or less taxing for people when they just simply like let go and you stop trying as hard. Like, maybe, yeah. you know, like that guy selling oranges, like I agree. Like I'm not saying his life wasn't meaningful, even though he sold oranges, but like, you know, there's so many people like, at least in Toronto, like, you know, like people like struggling with like, oh, like, what do I do? Like, what should I be doing? Like, you know, like, should I go into like law? Should I go into finance? Like, I think like society and like, you know, joining these like companies like Google, maybe that's where the whole meaning question comes to play again. It's like, um, you know, we're all just like really trying to impress each other so much that we forget what's really important. Mm-hmm. I also think there's a huge group of people who don't even find their meaning from their work. They find it from yeah. other places in their life. And then we also, especially like North American society, like tells us that we have to find our meaning from and that's 
the 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 index for happiness is so low in, in a lot of well, western i think yeah. i think the problem is is that for example like if you're spending most of your waking hours like your productive hours of the day working somewhere like you should derive some meaning out of it or else you're wasting most of your life like yeah that's the yeah. issue that's yeah, the issue of like if you, for example, if you didn't derive meaning, for example, like if you had investments, you don't really derive meaning from your investments, but you only work three hours a day on your, three hours a week on your investments, then you can derive meaning from a million other places in your life, like your family life, like you're like, like for, from a like athletic perspective, maybe you want to work on your body, like get really good at a sport, get really good at a hobby. Like, like there's ways to like focus on other things, but I think like you have to solve that like wealth thing first and like startups, I think might be the best way to do that quickly, or at least like if you f succeed if you fail like you're kind of fucked but like that's the whole thing I, is like you can you can end up like risk. doing an agency or a small business or like a something smaller because it just seems like based on what this essay like the whole kind of like the core idea of this essay i find and like i really agree with it is that like the way like if you even if you work at a google or an apple you're basically like a lion living in a zoo where like you're happy you're getting fed every day and like things are all right but like you like if you never go and try out the wild or like if you stay too long in the zoo you'll never be able to survive in the wild and like if yeah. you're sh and like coronavirus has shown us like like there's black swans things can happen we never expect and then people might be at you might be yeah. out of your job that you always like you're doing the same thing every day you exactly. don't know what to do you can't adapt that so like but the thing is if you if like let's just say even if you're like working at like a bigger company but you spent two years in the past like living off ramen noodles, like trying to start a startup, you can live through anything because like, you know, that grind of like not having any money, you know, that grind of like literally working 10 hours a day to make sure that your startup works. All right. Like but if unless you, you get that experience, you call the ramen it. noodle and die. I have a follow up question to that though. Like, so I agree completely with everything you said, but it, on that style of thinking, like is everyone meant to create their own, you know, business or something? Is that I don't know. Julian, Josh argues against this. I agree. I agree with Josh. I think, yeah, sorry, sorry. No, I think it's, it's fucking ridiculous to think that everyone should be in charge of themselves. Like, if you go out into the real world, like, if you believe in this, then you live in such a bubble. But it, that's yeah. not what we're like, talking about here. I don't believe Josh, everyone should be a founder. I believe everyone should work in a smaller no, company. No, but my question but Josh, was... Don't you think everybody should be, should be their own individual brand? Like... You not 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 don't think of it like a uh, conventional society kind of what what we label as brand like retail. I just think we're all like we're moving towards a time when there's such a placement, such such a such a um, importance laid on our individual uh, our individualism, right? Like that's why I feel like moving forward, focusing on the individual as a brand allows you to be able to expand out beyond just your job. Like I shouldn't be just, you know, a digital marketer. I, I can be a writer. I can be an influencer. I can be a family man. There's so many things that then open up opportunities for me to expand my horizon. Um, now, sorry, I think, uh, was it Dylan had a question? Yeah. I interrupted someone. Sorry. No, uh, no, no, he asked it. I asked it, but I, I was just going to say like, you know, we were talking before, like we want to like optimize meeting for as many people as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And like, it seems just based on like, uh, you know, a lot of things online and like reading studies and stuff like there is something to be said about like not having your own boss or sorry, not having a boss and like being your own boss um, in terms of feeling fulfilled. But I agree with Josh on some level, like society would sort of fall apart if like everyone was just like running their side hustle full time. And like, like, I, I don't know, like it seems like tech in like, especially VC Twitter, like in like Shopify and the way it's growing, like it's sort of like table stakes now, like everyone is going to have to have their side hustle, like everyone's gonna have to be their own brand and like that's like the gen z sort of shift i, I don't know if it's good for um you know a society that works together and, and like collaborates like i, I don't really know the, 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 the i'd like to think that when you're, you're yeah oh sorry josh go ahead sorry i think it was barty who was saying something oh i thought josh oh, was barty um because i can't see i'll, I'll say my point um i was just gonna say like i think it's not about everyone starting their own business it's about like for example like does a construction company need to have 500 people? No, yeah. like they have like, they have contractors <laughs> and they have different groups of people and they're all usually like 10 or less people or like 20 or less people. And you only really work with five or six people. And like normally at a big company, like can you, are you really on a team with 20 people? No, you're in a team with 10 people. It's just that like the, the thing is that 
this has to do with uh, forgetting the name of the law, but it's about how like the, the only reason companies exist is because it's cheaper to do the transactions. It like minimizes the transaction costs between mm. doing it inside versus externally. But the thing is the that cost of doing of business scale. across, across like uh, business boundaries, like doing stuff externally has become dramatically oh, yeah. cheaper. Yep. And because of like software as a service, you're getting all these kind of things that used to be like, you needed to hire someone to do it. Now you can just automate it. So like teams in are general getting, are just like, economy scale? sorry. Are you talking yeah. about economy of scale? No, it's kind of about economy of scale. It's just about, it's more about like the, Oh, it's the coast theorem of like mm, company size where it's like companies basically drift towards like, what's the optimal amount of, uh, optimal transaction costs basically inside and outside. And right now, like with bigger right. companies, they have a lot of stuff that they do internally, but it would be much more efficient if they externalized all these kind of teams and just hired people. Yeah, it's like hired smaller the, groups. Yes, killing loading. yes, yes like, and no. There's so many times where it makes way more sense to do something in-house than to outsource it. For example, my fulfillment. I wish I was sitting in the States right now and doing my own fulfillment. I can't yeah, but you're also a, group, a team of two people. Sure, but it, I, I think regardless, like, for example... Afria, the, the weed company here, right? They just built an in-house media team because they produce so much media content and it gives you more of an onus of control. The second you give it to a contractor, there's more risk. So there's a lot of elements of reality that aren't being taken into account when you look at things well, so from, from this perspective. Let me, let me push back on that and say that I think companies should focus on their core competencies and then either outsource everything else or not try like, for example, like Afria, like do they really need to grow their content that much? Like, is it essential to their business? If they just, if they just like focus all their effort on product and hire the best people to work on their product, which is like essentially what all businesses should be doing is be working on their product or their service. It's like, there's so many times where like the company size grows because they keep trying to do too much where they want to yeah, grow but- the business past like what's natural for that business. And like that's so really like, monstrosity, huge companies, like multinational companies that own a bunch of shit. And like, think about all the ma- multinational restaurant chains. What kind of food do they serve? Garbage. Like think about like what kind of software comes out of multinational massive companies? Garbage. So like, what do you think? Who, what kind of people work at those multinational massive companies? Garbage. So right. Like, but, but don't you think the end goal for like anyone starting that small software company who's competing with the multinational company, like the end goal in their head is like, they want to have that big corporation. That's an issue as well. You know what I mean? I think they shouldn't have that idea. And like Basecamp kind of like embodies this, their, their company is only like 50 something people and they try to keep it as small as possible because they know yeah. like it becomes unwieldy to manage and you can't innovate when you have a bigger company. So like you end up writing your own death certificate by growing too fast and too large. So when companies try, like, and this is the problem with VC is that they try to force companies to grow at a pace that's not natural for companies to grow at and forces them to take certain measures and put their business in a certain kind of way that doesn't make it conducive to happy employees or a sustainable business model. And like most of them are running on just like burning cash. So it's like the model's fucked up, but the whole idea of like having your own thing or like working on a small team, it's not even about working on a startup. For example, like, would you consider like, like any digital agency, a startup, like, no, but they're like a bunch of people who are like working in a small team and they're like doing like projects that are like sprints almost for different companies. And like, yeah, I've, I've, but that's I've, why I've, those companies are set up that way because that's where it's the most efficient. Like, and, like I, I think more and more at the end of the day, like these big companies are primed and manipulated to produce as much income and grow as autonomously as possible with as little room for human error as possible, which is key. Because as you get bigger, human error is the biggest, one of the largest factors. So I, 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 like, I, I love the idea that there's a better way to do it, but there's a reason it's done this way. I really get dissuaded by this idea of income because for me, like, monetary policy like value should necessitate monetary policy not the other way around right like you shouldn't we shouldn't make money for the sake of making money we should we should as a as like this is again me speaking idealistically but like companies should should create value that then revolve like that then yeah. dictate I agree. how money how money operates around it. You, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, it's like yeah. So like people are not trying to create value. Unfortunately, they're trying to extract value, and that's like the biggest problem. Is like 
Which and really, in a, in, a, in a system like that, you're still a consumer. Like you think that you're a producer because you're, you're getting money, but really you're still a consumer because you're feeding into this, to the already existing system. Like think about a great example of this is, look at all the um, natural gas and fossil fuel companies like ExxonMobil. And these guys, like, you know, a big example project is uh, what they did in Papua New Guinea. They built a $30 billion facility to extract and pump out as much gas as possible. To them, they're making a lot of money and they're getting a lot of value out of it for their shareholders, for, yeah. for whoever is working within that system. And mind you, that's thousands of jobs, right? But again, we go back to this debate of what, what should you be looking for when you're looking for a job, right? Something like that, even though it's giving a lot of value to the people who are associated with it, is destroying our yeah, environment, which exactly. actually is probably the biggest economy in itself. Like the biome, the biosphere itself is worth trillions and trillions of yeah, dollars. We're like destroying I, I would, and I'm getting like, I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but my values are that I, I prefer to have clean drinking water and, 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 uh, and non-polluted air than to have, you know, a couple extra thousand in my pocket. Yeah, I agree as well. I think, I think we all agree on like the main points here. I think, um, I know Josh is playing devil's advocate a lot here. And, uh, all right. I think we're running out of time here. We're already over time. Um, so yeah, like, I think we all get like the main crux of this essay and like, I don't know. I think the biggest thing that we can do, like to kind of support this kind of thinking more in like our group of friends and other people is to like, I don't know, just lead by example, like what Josh is doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Except not with drugs because drugs are bad kids. <laughs> and with that, it's the end of this Rome on Sundays. Follow me on Excellent. Pornhub. Yeah. Follow Josh on Pornhub. Juice for Teeny 96, 69. <laughs> All right. Peace out boys. Yeah. I don't know how that Peace. is. <laughs> All right, peace. <laughs>